Hi, I'm Ariane, and today we're working on one of the handful of side projects that you need to do in order to finish your coat hardy. Today's project is these small fabric buttons that you use to close up the sleeves on your coat hardy. As you can see on this one, that's how they're used. I need to make more. So, let's get started. Okay, so now you can see my workspace. And this is a great use of little odd scraps from cutting out your coat hardy. I could not... Hmm, I could not tell you what this scrap is from, what part of it. It doesn't matter. It's too small to use for anything else. So, it's perfect for making buttons. And this, by the way, is a perfect button pattern. I'm sure you've got a few of them. It doesn't matter what color the thread is. Just trace around it. The circles don't even have to be precise, but the better they are, the easier it is to make a circular button. And if you're showing off your buttons, you really don't want a wonky one. them as close together as you can without overlapping. And make a whole bunch of circles. For a full late 14th century cotardy, your buttons are going to be approximately as close together as you can make them. At least halfway up your arm. So at least to your elbow. The buttons are about a centimeter wide. So for every centimeter and a half of arm that you have, you need a button. And you need buttons for the cuff of your sleeve. If you're doing a cut hardy that has a goblet cuff coming to basically your pinky knuckle, which is what I like. It's a whole lot of buttons. Thankfully, it's not really that difficult or time consuming. Because by the time you make enough, it's time consuming. <laughs> It is, however, a good little project to have on hand when you're sitting at TV watching whatever's on, <sighs> watching whatever 
you happen to be binging on right now. And I know we're all running through our binge programs. So basically, just keep making circles until you're pretty sure you've made enough circles. Then make a couple more. I usually take my smallest scrap that's big enough to be useful for buttons and turn that entirely into button circles. And then if I don't think that was enough, I'll take the second smallest or second weirdest shaped one and do the same thing. Eventually, you get to be pretty sure that you've got enough buttons, you set the rest of the scraps aside to become something else, like maybe a pouch. scrap I will have enough because as you saw I have a few buttons already on my sleeve There are different types of coat hardy sleeves, and not all of them need buttons. Like, I haven't seen an Italian picture yet that looked like it had buttons on it, but their sleeves also look looser than my 14th century coat hardy sleeves, so that could have something to do with it. If you're doing the French cotardi sleeves, which is what I always do, if you're doing the French cotardi, then you just need buttons on the sleeves of your undergown, which is cut just like a cotardi, except that the sleeves at least come to here, and preferably come to here. The cotardi sleeves only come to about the elbow, whether they have the white band there or just a band falling away off the back in a material that looks like it's just a continuation of the sleeve. The undergown or sorquini or coat, C-O-T-E, Make sure that your arms are decent and warm enough. And the cotardi sleeves don't get in the way of showing off the extra fabric. Eventually, the cotardi developed into a cotardi blonde crossover and continue to be worn alongside the hoop blonde. And that Cotardi hoop blonde hybrid or crossover had a Cotardi cut everywhere, especially that beautiful neckline. But it had very, very full sleeves, like a hoopalant. In England, where I suppose it's always a little bit colder than in my beautiful France, their coat has long sleeves, just like 
like the Sorkwini, which they call a kernel. Too small right there, it goes off the fabric. But we scoot it over a little bit. And now we can cut one. You do have to have a firm bit of pressure there so that the fabric doesn't move as you're marking with your pen. And I don't have a problem using a real pen for this. In fact, the water soluble pens that you use for sewing don't really show up well in this. I've found that they also tend to dry out really quickly when I'm doing this. And since I'm cutting along that line and then folding the edge in and falling everything up, it's not going to show. Maybe if I were using white silk, but otherwise no, it's not a concern. So I'll use a pen that will give a mark that will show up quite definitely and not make me fuss around too much. In other things, I will use that fabric marking pen. Now, I'm pretty sure that at this point, I'm already marking for buttons that will not be used on this gown. But, hey, why not? It's an odd bit of fabric. It's not like I'll be able to use this little bit of... Um, we'll stop there. That'll give us enough, and I might find some other use for this. I just use for the classes that I teach on how to make these buttons. Because that's the perfect use of a couple extra button circles. Or I just keep them around because this is one of my favorite shades of blue. Chances are I will make another cut hardy with it at some point. Oh, an early 14th century gown, kind of the predecessor to the cut hardy. Those look nice with these buttons too. I haven't been marking these circles for very long, and I've got an awful lot of them marked. So, like I said, it's not a particularly time-consuming project. That'll change when we get to the point where we're actually cutting out the buttons, and it'll change even more when we get to the point where we're sewing them. But for now, this stage is quick and easy. And that's a good place to stop. And I've found 
that with these non-cushioned scissors, which have a really nice sharp blade, I might add, but there's no cushioning here. And if I'm using them a lot, I get rubbed right here and it starts to not be terribly comfortable. But if I put that finger and just that finger on the outside, it works beautifully. the raw material for one button. Yay! Now, cutting them out individually is kind of boring. I kind of go along and cut strips of buttons, just weaving in and out between them. I have another button, kind of. We have four buttons, or the raw material therefore. I'm going to pause this video and get back to you when we're ready to start sewing buttons. If you're doing 14th century or 15th century garb, you're going to want this book. I have a few bookmarks. They have pages detail every aspect of construction of probably everything 
that they have found. And on pages 168 and 169, they show these buttons. Over here on 171, they discuss how to make them. So if my lesson isn't enough, look it up. You'll be able to figure out everything you need. This is what I taught myself from. You need this book. We're almost there. I just have four more to cut out. Okay, so now I have a large stack of button circles and a slightly smaller stack of scrap material and we're ready to move on to the next stage. Now usually you want the thread that you're using to match your fabric as closely as possible but for my first one to make sure there's lots of contrast so you can see what I'm doing. Yes, I use a long thread. You don't have to. But I've been sewing since I was two and a short thread just seems weird. So want to make sure that it's long enough that you can double it over because that makes it twice as strong. You don't have to double it over but it's generally better that way when you're doing something like this. When I'm hemming something it's single strand. Now, I'm making a quick knot just rolling it off my finger, pulling it tight. And now I'm going to have to move the camera so you can see what I'm doing. Alright. So you're going to want to sew in small running stitches about half a centimeter from the outer edge. And it is generally easier to do these one at a time. So a little bit past your knot, just in case it slides when you start pulling. Your knot is on this side of the fabric. You want your thread to come out on this side because your next stage is gathering actually folding then gathering. So you fold the edges in right where your stitches show you to. 
hold it and pull on the thread. And it's never perfect the first time. But this one's not bad. And you have it snugged up as tight as it'll go. If you have little bits that are sticking out, and don't look neat. You can loosen it up a bit and use your needle to push those in and tighten it up as snug as it'll go. And it should be kind of cute. And at this point, you're going to want to hold it to set the gathered area. It's all puckered up right here. It's facing up. And the thread end is away from you. And that is 12 o'clock. Come down here to 6 o'clock. Put the needle through. And then go up here to one o'clock, put the needle through, and pull. Seven o'clock. Two o'clock. Eight o'clock. Three o'clock. Nine o'clock. Four o'clock. Get out of the loop. Ten o'clock. Five o'clock. And lastly, eleven o'clock. If you've done this right, your opening is not going to open anymore. If not, take a few more stitches. And at this point, I like to play with it, look at it head on, which is from the side that doesn't have the gathers. Is it round? Is it pretty? Yes. So we're going to take some stab stitches through here lock everything together straight through from where you did the clock to the face of the button and back 
And the stitches on the face of the button don't have to be big. In fact, you don't want them to be big. Four or five stitches should be fine. And then come back to the clock side and make a knot. Now, that didn't take long at all. If I had used a matching thread, I would be ready to sew this one onto my cotardy. Or stick it in a container and save it to sew them all on at the same time. However, this one has contrasting thread, and so it's going to go in my examples back. Also another one with matching thread, and then I'll show you how it gets sewn onto the cotardy. Now I'm taking the same stitches with my doubled over thread, approximately half a centimeter in from the raw edge. These stitches are much less easy to spot because they're done in matching thread. Now I'm folding the extra fabric in. And I have seen people go around twice, once at the very, very edge and once about half a centimeter in. And they basically use that outer circumference to pull their edges in. But really that's not necessary. You're just giving yourself an extra step. And it's not in the extant buttons. 
I don't know how thoroughly they check when they were writing up textiles and clothing, but they don't have that extra step in there. And it's unnecessary, so why do it? So now I'm doing the clock. I should have told you that earlier. That was one o'clock. Seven. You're basically making a teeny tiny pouch that is stuffed full with a seam allowance on the edge of that pouch. That was eight. Three. Nine. And yes, I find it's useful to count. This is four. Because otherwise you'll be going around and like... Oh great, what number was I on? Am I done? And 11. Now I'm checking that it's pretty, and it is. Smush it a little bit because all the squeezing makes it kind of pouch shaped instead of round. And we take the stitches. And now, I'm about to make my knot. There. One more button, and this one is ready to go, my cut hardy. So I will show you how to do that. Now, our late 14th and early 15th century ancestors did not do their buttons quite the same way that we do. These buttons are on the very edge of the fabric. And the buttonholes 
but pretty close to the edge too. Pay no attention to the fact that they are machined. I was trying to get this gown ready for an event that was coming up and haven't yet had time to go back through and cover them properly with hand stowing. I've washed this cotardy a few times since I made it. And the marks that I put here to tell where my buttons needed to be have gone away. But I can make new marks. I believe these were yes. 1.5 centimeters apart. So I know that this one needs to go right here. I don't even need to mark it. basically have a small sphere and you have stitched up and down this way you've closed off the south pole but your stitches to attach your button to your fabric are going to go right through the equator And now you're going to do the clock again. Only this time your clock is a little more wobbly. You want to go through the button several points along the equator so it's held as securely as possible. And you don't want the button to be all the way down the fabric. You want about a millimeter gap in between. That's going to be the shank of your button. Now once more through, and you see this loop here, I like to go through the loop. I 
seems nice and secure. And I come to the inside and make another knot. And there. One more cute little button is on my coat hardy. And I am that much closer to having it all finished. So I hope you've enjoyed our little lesson. And I hope that you good use making your own code hardy. If you see me at an event, show me your work. Let me admire what you've done. Thank you.